we can't go call this the new normal so that we can go back to the way it was before the COVID hit. Before COVID hit was not normal. It was absolutely destructive the way we were living. We've got to go to something different. From Simbi Foundation, it's Impact in the 21st Century, a show about innovators, activists, entrepreneurs, authors, and the positive impact they make. I'm Aaron Friedland, and on the show today, I'm truly grateful to be speaking with environmental activist and biologist David Suzuki about climate change, effective environmental activism, and the importance of critical thinking in today's world of constant media consumption. And thank you to RBC for sponsoring this episode. And David, before we jump right in, I'd like to take a moment to share just a brief list of your accomplishments to provide some context for the conversation. First and foremost, a researcher, and we can just keep it to fruit flies. Yes. An, an educator, professor with over or just about 40 years at UBC alone, a broadcaster in both TV and radio, Suzuki on science, many others along the way, the nature of things, a planet for the taking. Uh, you're also an author with an, over 19 well-known publications and books, and I won't be addressing all of them, but Letters to My Grandchildren is absolutely one of my all-time favorites. And among many other impressive accomplishments, you're the co-founder of the David Suzuki Foundation, which has a mission to protect nature's diversity and the well-being of all life now and for the future. Does that sum it up correctly? No, oh, uh, more than enough. You left out the most important uh, uh, title I have, which is grandfather. And I understand that you partly like that title because you have a great relationship with your grandkids and they always, grandchildren, as you put it in letters to, our, to my grandchildren, always idolize and they don't live with you to see all of your faults. Exactly. <laughs> So I can tell you, I, my grandchild, I've had three grandchildren here, a five-year-old and two and a half-year-old twins. And we just, uh, they went down with their mom and dad to Victoria yesterday. So for the first time in six months, they aren't here. And I'm feeling completely lost and purposeless. They were great to have. They gave me a sense that I could actually do something for somebody. I'm sorry to hear they're not with you at the moment. So something that I want to speak to you about is you've written and spoken at length about how TV, uh, about how when TV was introduced and how after you had your first kind of stint um, on TV at the, at the university, how you were shocked to find out that people were watching you on a Sunday morning. Yeah. And how you just couldn't believe that people would spend their time actually, actually consuming information at that time through that medium. And you've, you've continued to write and speak um, about how you see, essentially in terms of mediums for communication, writing being the most important, um, auditory or, or radio being the second, and then TV just being the least effective. And I'd love for you to elaborate on that and to explain in greater detail why it is you feel that way. And, and well, I, I fully it, agree with you. I, I think it's in direct relation to, to the amount of effort that you put into it to derive the messages or the information uh, being given to you. So when you read, and the thing I, that's lovely about reading, although now I guess you can press pause and go back and forth with television, but with reading, you know, you can go back other pages and look and reread and, and you can slow down, you can take your time with it. And uh, I don't know, I just feel my brain is most alive. And there's the time then to absorb what I'm getting. With radio, I'm, radio is the medium I love the most as a, a communicator. You use every listener's brain to create Stories. There's a wonderful Spike Jones uh, uh, sequence that you're too young to know this, in which he shows how powerful it is by invoking, you know, this unbelievable armada of airplanes and dropping bombs, uh, and all of it is just with words. But you're creating the whole thing in in your brain, and and uh, I find that with radio, there it's uh, you can take the time. There's it's funny. It's uh, television is to me the most overwhelming medium because 
it's effortless. You sit there and you just get overwhelmed with the images. And uh, but they're total fabrications. They're creations. Each second is expensive. You know, it used to be film that was expensive, or so it's all set up. And what you do is you create a reality through the medium of uh, visuals that are very, very different, I think, from the spoken word and, and print. I, it's just a different medium. It's very powerful, but very superficial, superficial as far as I'm concerned. Right. But, you know, the important thing is that I began a career as a broadcaster because I had spent eight years studying in the United States. And those were... It was an amazing period to be in the United States. I went to a, a college, an undergraduate uh, college um, in 1954 that gave me an education that I couldn't get uh, in Canada at that time. There was no real school and a sense of an elite group of scholars. And it made me what I am as a, as a scholar. And uh, then in my last year, in a senior year at Amherst, on October 4th, 1957, I'll bet you don't know what happened then. 1957. So I'm starting my last year in college and the Soviet Union announces mm. Sputnik. It was a shock. Like nobody realized that there was a space program. And then, you know, every hour and a half that satellite came overhead and the beep, 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 it was like thumbing its nose at you saying, ha, 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 look at me. And the Americans then cranked up. They had three different, you know, Army, Air Force, Navy. They all had their own rockets. They launched theirs. Every one blew up. Meanwhile, the Russians launched the first animal in space, a dog, Laika, the first man, Yuri Gagarin, the first team of cosmonauts, the first spacewalk, the first woman, Valentina Tereshkova. The Americans, they didn't blink. They just said, we got to catch up to these guys. They're really far ahead. And of course, in 1961, Kennedy announced, we're going to get American astronauts to the moon and back in less than a decade. That was the big challenge. Now, so this was an amazing time after Sputnik, you know, the Americans poured billions of dollars. They set up NASA. They started pouring money into creating science departments. I mean, here I'm a foreign student. All they had to do was say, oh, I like science. They threw money at you. It was a glorious time. And then uh, when, after I had my PhD, I did a postdoc and I went to a, a, a fruit fly meeting you know and i wasn't looking for a job and i got uh when i got back to uh, my office this is in oak ridge tennessee uh i got a job offer from stanford a job offer from san diego state and a job offer from the university of california davis like i hadn't even been looking for a job it was a a glorious time yet i left why did i leave well I, you know, there was a lot of opportunities, but there was something about America. It was this kind of glorification of money. Money seemed to be what people really admired. And I felt Canada was different and, you know, not better, but different. Like to me, Canada meant the, the at the time it was a CCF, a socialist party, it was a legitimate party. In the States, the CCF would have been called outright communist. In Canada, Tommy Douglas was a national icon, a national treasure. He would have been hated in the United States, but I admired him. We had Medicare. We had the CBC. We had the National Film Board. We had equalization payments between the provinces. These were, to me, distinguishing parts of what made Canada hmm. preferable to me. And so I turned down all these jobs. And, well, I got heavily involved in the civil rights. Um, I was the only non black member of the NAACP in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And I finally decided I didn't want to live in this, in the United States. And I came home to Canada. When I got back to Canada in 1962, I was stunned. I got my first grant and it was for $4,200. And they said, normally we give a first year assistant professor 
$3,500, but you got, you have a year of postdoc, so we're giving you 4,200. The guys that I graduated with in Chicago with PhDs, we're all getting 60 to $80,000 grants. And I got a $4,200 grant. And I said, Jesus, you know, uh, we got a, obviously science is not highly regarded in Canada. And um, that's when I, I, I was given an opportunity to do this television program in Edmonton when I got my first job at the University of Alberta. That's when I realized what a powerful tool television was. If people are watching television at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning, holy shit, that's, that's really a way of really reaching an audience. So that began my television career. And my, I was driven by the belief that people, in order to make important decisions in their lives, people needed information. Now, people, if you look at newspapers or television uh, programs, you would swear that Canadians' obsessions are with politics, with business, with celebrity and sports. Those are the, the big areas. And they ignore the reality that by far the most powerful force shaping our lives today is science. Science when applied by industry, medicine, and the military. So I went into television thinking, my programs are going to glisten like jewels. Now, even back then in the uh, early 60s, we referred to television as the boob tube. You know, we knew that it was kind of pretty superficial. I used to call it a cesspool, but my programs were going to gleam like jewels in a cesspool and people would pluck them up and savor them. But I didn't realize when you jump into a cesspool, you look like a turd like everybody else. That's a whole nother speech. But, but that got me uh, going in television. I wanted to give people information so they could make meaningful decisions that were informed decisions about how science was going to interact with their lives. I never dreamt of a period when anybody with a cell phone would have access to more information than people have ever had in history. You can get into the Library of Congress in the United States on your little cell phone. Mm -hmm. You've got now access to more information, and yet the degree of ignorance today is breathtaking. You look at what's happening with uh, all of these conspiracy theories, uh, QAnon, uh, all of these crazy, you know, the Flat Earth Society is flourishing. Um, you want to find that uh, climate change is, is a hoax. Dozens of websites telling, I mean, what the hell has happened? My dream was give people information, make informed decisions. I never realized that that information would be primarily pornography, would be about buying stuff, and would be bullshit being promulgated by corporations. So it's a sad position today. It's, it's interesting you bring that up because, well, first of all, you've spoken at length about, you know, when you first found YouTube, you were excited. Yeah. I think you were looking for a hagfish. That's, That's right. Exactly what I think you were talking about. My God, about. you've been doing your research. Oh, I've checked you out. I've checked you out. And um, it, you, you enter these holes. You, you absolutely enter these YouTube holes. And then QAnon, as, as you're saying, right, this is, this is just incredible algorithms giving you, essentially just digging you deeper into the echo chamber that you already believe in. Yeah. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears here a little it's bit. It's because... staggering because what I find is mm -hmm. people don't have to change their minds. If you want to think, oh, God, climate change, God would never allow that to happen. You can just scroll through the Internet till you find something that confirms what you already believe. Yep. And that's the frightening thing now, because we are absolutely uh, uh, uncritical. We just look for people that agree with us and away you go. And it's, it's staggering. I've been, I watched, uh, what was it the other day? Interviews with uh, pro-Trumpers mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. who, you know, and, and the, uh, these are just ordinary people. Yeah, but he lies. Yes, we agree he lies. Yeah, but look how he treats women. Yeah, he treats women uh, badly. Now look what he's saying about uh, uh, people in the service who are, are serving, you know, in Vietnam and so on. Yeah, yeah, I heard all that. But I'm with Trump all the way because he's wrecking the goddamn system that is what's, you know, it's just a staggering level of uncritical uh, uh, thinking and behavior today. Okay, sorry. I, no, I, I, I kind of uh, sidetracked you. you, I know, but... Uh, Th- this, is, this is perfect. So what I'm wondering about is, what do you... So we, we know that we're becoming a society that don't read as an active activity. We listen as a secondary or, or, we, or we watch as a, as a passive activity. And we don't want to, it's too difficult to actually read a full article. So we'll read a snippet of what it's about, gaining our news from Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. And then we'll think we have the entire story. And now we'll start to make decisions and and share ideas based on that. And as an educator, which I believe first and foremost, you are, what advice, what wisdom can you share with the next generation to start to change the way that we do consume this information? So that we don't I, elect individuals like uh, who you're alluding to. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it really has to do with being critical. The first thing you ask is where or who is saying this? Where are they getting paid? What is their their purpose? I, I mean, if you don't ask those simple questions, then uh, I don't see any way out of the morass that we're in. We have to be far more critical about the source. This is why I've really valued the CBC. The CBC is beholden to the Canadian taxpayer. It's a it's a public broadcaster. And God damn it, you know, it stands, represents something in terms of its credibility different from any of the commercial uh, networks. And so um, uh, I've always valued very highly that the CBC is is uh, something that has been held in very high esteem in the sense that we've always had to compete with the big corporations, ABC, NBC, uh, CBS. Those were our competitors, not PBS. PBS is an elite broadcaster, but it services a tiny fraction of the American public. But CBC has been up there credible and people better appreciate what they've got. Appreciate that. Now, just to shift gears a little bit, you talk about in um, letters to my grandchildren, you talk about Easter Island off the Chilean coast and in which the inhabitants essentially saw that their trees and their resources were depleting and didn't really do anything about it until it was ultimately too late. And I'm wondering what, if, if Easter Island is a microcosm of planet earth, what do we need to start seeing to, to really wake up? Because we can know the earth is changing its pH levels and we can know that it's getting warmer, but, you're, but we're not able to see no more trees. It, it's a slightly different reality. What has to start happening for us to wake up? Well, I, uh, I personally think the fundamental challenge is not climate change, is not species extinction, although these two issues are probably going to do us in. But I think it's the underlying root cause that is the problem, and it's the hardest thing of all to change. And that is the shift. For 99% of our existence, we were fundamentally aware that we lived in a complex web of relationships, relationships with other species, with air, water, sunlight, uh, soil. Uh, We understood that we were a part of nature and depended on it. For 95% of our existence, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers. Now, Wade can tell you all of the the actual timing of this, but we, we simply lived in a world in which we had to navigate from nature's generosity and abundance carrying everything we had on our on our backs. So you know damn well, that's the way that we lived for most of our time as a species, and we understood very much 
how dependent we were on the natural world. 10,000 years ago, you get the, this fundamental huge shift, and that is agriculture. And farmers still understand that uh, weather, climate, the seasons, they're critical to the way you farm. You know, we farmers know that the amount of snow in the winter is directly related to moisture in the soil in the summer. They know that certain insects will be predators on, on insect pests. They understand that certain plants fix nitrogen as fertilizer. Farmers know that we are a part of and dependent on nature. It's been the fundamental shift, and there's a whole sequence, I think, you know, with the Industrial Revolution, with, and you have thinkers like Newton and... Uh, and Descartes and people who began to think, oh, science, our thinking, uh, Francis Bacon, you know, uh, uh, Scientia, Potestas es, uh, knowledge is power. Um, uh, Descartes saying, you know, uh, I think, therefore I am elevating the human mind as if somehow it's separate and the highest uh, thing. Uh, and ultimately, I believe when you get the Industrial Revolution, you begin to get the feeling, oh, we're not like any other creature. We're smart. We're so smart. We, don't, we aren't bound by the laws of nature. We can travel faster than any other biological being. We can create things that will work 24 hours a day without having to take a pee break or, or eat, uh, eat a meal. We can, uh, uh, we can see to the very edge of the universe. We can... You know, we, we've, we can discover a, a, a world in a drop of water. Like, we are this amazing creature. And you begin to think, oh, we're special. We're outside of nature, and we're only limited by our imagination. And so I think the fundamental shift has been from an ecocentric worldview to an anthropocentric one. Mm. And the anthropocentric worldview, we're it. Everything is about us. And I have to admit, when I started working with the nature of things, I really had an anthropocentric, you know, I was an environmentalist, but I was a very shallow environmentalist. Oh, we got to stop polluting, got to stop clear cutting and all that. But I remember having an argument with, uh, with my boss saying, you know, uh, he would, why should we bother fighting for um, you know, a, a hundred whooping cranes. If they disappear, it's not going to make a damn bit of difference. And I said, the problem with that is the loss of those whooping cranes diminishes me. I am so great that I can look out and my world is enriched by those whooping cranes. And to see those whooping cranes go diminishes me. I mean, it's such an anthropocentric worldview. And I learned through my boss Jim Murray and I learned from uh, working in the nature of things and meeting all kinds of people, there's a much deeper sense. And that is that shift from ecocentric to anthropocentric. And that's the challenge. Now, the shift is very, very simple. It's to acknowledge that earth, air, fire, and water are absolutely critical to our survival and well being. So I tell this story. I got a call four years ago from the CEO of one of the biggest companies in the tar sands of Alberta. Mm -hmm. Could I come and talk to you? I said, of course, I'm not into fighting. Come and talk to me. Next day he showed up and I thanked him and said how honored I was and all that. And I said, before you come in my office, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to leave your identity as a CEO of an oil company outside. Mm -hmm. Come in as a human being. I said, what's the point about talking about pipelines or carbon taxes, uh, carbon emissions, or any of that stuff, till you and I begin from a platform of complete agreement on our fundamental needs. Then we can build from that and see how we can work our way out. He, he, this is not why he came down to talk, but he was a, a decent man, so reluctantly I could see he came in. So I thanked him. I said, I know this isn't what you expected, but we live in a world that is shaped by laws of nature and there's nothing we can do about those laws. I said, physics dictates you can't build a rocket that will travel faster than the speed of light. 
First and second law of thermodynamics tell you, you can't build a perpetual motion machine. The law of gravity, if I trip, I'm going to hit my head on the floor. I mean, we live with that. That's the law of physics, laws of physics. Chemistry, it's the same. The atomic property of the elements determines melting point, freezing point, boiling point, uh, diffusion constants, reaction rates. All of that is set by the atomic properties of the elements. We know in chemistry what we can and cannot do. And finally, I said in biology, it's the same. Every species has a maximum number that can be attained and maintained indefinitely. And that's determined by the carrying capacity of an ecosystem or habitat. Exceed that number and your population will fall. Humans are not bound to a single ecosystem or habitat, but our home is the biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists. That's our home. And there are limits determined by how much we consume and uh, how many of us there are. And I said, you know, you and I, we're animals. And I could see right away he did not like to be called which is such an amazing thing. You know, I remember uh, Paul Ehrlich telling me the story of where some woman came up and gave him shit because he said, we're animals. She said, my kids are not animals, they're human beings. And he said, madam, I'm a biologist. If they're not animals, they must be plants. So this, I think, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm a biologist, we're animals. I said, Mr. CEO, what is the most important uh, thing that we need? for our survival. And instead of giving the answer that any Air, child oxygen. would say, he's going, hmm. So I'm, I could see he's thinking, job, money. I said, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. So would you agree with me? Clean air is this gift we have from the biosphere. And that we have a responsibility to protect that air because it's not only humans, it's all the other terrestrial beings that depend on that air. We have a responsibility. And I said the same with water. I said you and I are 60 to 70% water by weight. And that, but our bodies don't retain it. We leak it from our skin and our eyes and our mouth and our crotch. And we lose water all the time. I said, Mr. CEO, if you don't have clean water for four to six days, you're dead. If you have to drink contaminated water, you're sick. So clean water is like clean air. It's this sacred gift from, from nature that we have a responsibility to protect. And I said, all of our food was once alive and most of it came from the soil. And if we don't have food for four to six weeks, it's a lot longer, we'll die and contaminated, you know, so, so soil and food is like clean air and clean water. And finally, I said, every bit of the energy in your body and mine that we need to move and work and reproduce and grow, all of that is sunlight. Sunlight captured by plants in photosynthesis, and that is what you're digging out of the soil, is sunlight captured over millions and millions of years and then stored in the ground. And the miracle of my life and your life is those four things that indigenous people call earth, air, fire, and water, those sacred gifts, are cleansed, renewed, replenished by the web of life. You know, it's all of the, the things in the soil that are part of the hydrologic cycle that are filtering the water as it cartwheels around the planet. It's life that creates soil. This is why when Matt Damon was stranded on Mars and he had a year's worth of potatoes, but he had to wait four years to get rescued, there was lots of dust and sand and clay on, on uh, Mars, but there was no soil. So he had to put poop into the holes in the ground so that he could grow his potatoes. Life creates the very soil that gives us our food. And uh, so I said, those are the, the elements that enable us to live and flourish. Earth, air, fire, and water, and our relatives, the plants and animals that share the planet. I said, if you will shake hands with me and agree with me, I will do everything I can to help you and your company. So what do you think he did? 
probably not shake your hand, to be honest. He couldn't. He was a good man. He really was a good man. But he couldn't, because if he were to go back to his shareholders and say, well, I had a discussion with Suzuki, and whatever our company does, we can't mess with the air, water, and soil. we got to take care of that. He'd be fired in a flash. And this is the problem. We've created this thing called the economy and corporations. These are not forces of nature. They're human constructs. And we've elevated them so high that we had a prime minister who for nine and a half years said doing something about climate change is crazy economics. It will destroy the economy to try to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So by saying that, he elevated the economy above the very atmosphere that gives us weather, climate, and the seasons, and the air that we need to breathe. So the game is fixed. This is why, you know, we hear now about, oh, well, corporate social responsibility, and oh, the corporations, and Bill Gates, and all these guys, oh, gee, you know, we gotta, we got to do good stuff. Yeah, right, great. Meanwhile, during the COVID crisis, guess what? Amazon and, and all of these guys are making profit like you wouldn't believe because making money the faster and the better, uh, you know, the faster and, and the more you make, the better it is. So that game is responsible, no matter how responsible we are being, the game itself is fixed and you will get fired if you're not in the business of making as much money as you can. Uh, the, uh, so the economy is itself a driver of the destructive nature. And the problem is it's the same with politics. We've created a political system and yeah, it sounds good, you know, democracy and we all have the right to vote, but people get into office and then their highest priority, and we saw this in spades when Trump was elected, from the minute he was unexpectedly elected, his highest priority then was getting reelected. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when, when Mr. Trudeau was elected, he went to, uh, he went to Paris only months later and uh, announced Canada is back, signed the Paris Agreement, said we should try to keep temperature closer to 1.5 than two above pre-industrial levels. I called him and said, that's, well, sorry, I, I emailed him and said, that's a tough target. We're all excited, but are you serious about that? And he emailed me back and said, I'm very serious. So we celebrated, we said, this is great. I wrote articles saying how fantastic, this, you know, we've turned a corner and we've got a new regime and blah, blah, blah. And then what did he do? He bought a pipeline. And I emailed him and I said, why did you run for office? Isn't it to, to be in a position to protect the future for your own children? Your own children are going to pay the price for that decision. And yet, you, you know, you, you're doing that? Why? To serve Alberta? Because you think you're going to get a footprint in Alberta? And his response to me was, he doesn't reply to my emails anymore. So he's stuck playing that game and the game is again it's fixed and it's the same with the, the laws we look i i want to i want to push you on on that for, for one moment if i can okay. so in in terms of fossil fuels when we know just how well photosynthesis works we we it is so clear science shows us that photovoltaic pv solar panels are the way to go because that's what nature has actually grown out of its soil for us. Now, when you know that as a core scientific truth, that this is the way to go, and then you have, whether it's a big CEO or whether it's a prime minister saying, no, 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 we, we need to fuel the economy. We need to generate the economy. So we need to actually build a pipeline. How, how do you as a scientist, but also an activist, Think about this, because there's a long-term game and there's a short-term game, and there's a core scientific truth, and there's one that's stupid. And how do you explain to people why it is that you should not be doing wasting money on on pipelines for job creation right now? Well, the 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 problem is that you know even the the deepest environmentalist has always got to say, look, this makes economic sense. 
we've always got to justify this thing in terms of the economic possibilities or the economic realities. Mm -hmm. And so it, it really uh, tears us down because the discussion isn't on the right plane. The Minister of the Environment in France resigned on camera because he said the government isn't doing enough. And someone in uh, from Quebec asked me, do you think McKenna should resign? And I said, yes, because, you know, I understand that there are political constraints, but he's not even saying that we're in a crisis and we have to take uh, urgent steps. And if we have, I, I kept saying to McKenna, you're not the minister of the of finance. You're the minister of the environment. Why do you have to keep raising the whether or not you're going to make money or the, that this is going to serve corporations by doing the right thing? That's not your job. So the, the conversation is always skewed because of the need to serve the mm -hmm. economy. Even when we try to justify uh, photovoltaics, we say the jobs that will be created are, are more sustainable in the long run. And, and uh, you know, it'll... Uh, uh, it's true. It's true. Uh, but we shouldn't have to justify it. Is what no, this is the only thing. That, but, you know, we even have, uh, look at uh, uh, Michael Moore's latest film now, you know, uh, he's trying to seek perfection and he's, he's dissing uh, uh, the solar and wind uh, energy saying it's just, you know, not efficient enough. And it's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not the, uh, the way to go. Uh, He's giving the uh, oil people a perfect an ammunition in the drive for perfection. You know, mm -hmm. that, I, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. So I have another question for you on this, David, and that is when you think about our planet that, that you're leaving behind to your grandkids, and this is obviously something that you are incredibly passionate about and think wonderfully deeply about. It's, it's such a beautiful book to, to read and just to hear how you think about things. One of the, something that I notice is that I was not taught what my personal or business values and mission was at school. No one in high school ever said, Aaron, what are your, what are your values? What, are, what is your personal mission? And what, what I'm thinking about when I'm reading your book is you are doing the most beautiful job explaining to your grandkids th this process of finding values and how you're imparting values on them, whether it's cleaning the dishes or, or whatever it is you, that you're doing. But how do you find, how do, how do you instruct people or guide people in that process of getting clear on, on their values and the type of values that are coexistent for a sustainable future for this planet? Well, you know, quite frankly, it's gotta begin before kids ever get to school. Mom and dad have, she, my, you learn your basic values. Who, who said that you, by the time you get to kindergarten, you or those early years of school, those are the most important times when your values are being set. I really believe mom and dad are the ones that impart uh, the values uh, to you. And you can see that in spades in every one of the uh, the trump children you know they they have learned very very well from their father their mm -hmm. their values and i think by then by the time they get to university uh I, it's way beyond me to try to change those values i can only give them uh information changing behavior and values that is a really really tough tough challenge so I, uh, the lessons that I try to impart are very, very simple. It's all about air, water, soil. I love to talk to children in Toronto. You know, I say, uh, when you turn the tap on, do you know where your water comes from? Well, they have no idea. So see, it goes down the drain and it goes out into Lake Ontario. Oh, you know, they're quite surprised. And, and then I say, well, when you flush the toilet, do you know where that goes? No, they do, don't know. Uh, well, it goes out into a storage area, and over time, uh, it gets, uh, we hope, it gets treated by fermentation, and then it goes out into Lake Ontario. That's a big education. They're not learning the most fundamental things. Like when you turn on the lights, where does that electricity come from? You know, that's, uh, 
boy, that's uh, and where and your food like there. I remember we have this uh, CBC bring your kid to, to work day, you know, they, and I remember this boy came in, his father was one of the producers and he popped in and we're, I was chatting with him and he started to snicker. He said, my sister is so stupid. She thinks Kentucky fried chicken is a bird. Yeah, and I thought, oh my God, you know, we're so disconnected from the really important things. But that's the level at which we've got to reconnect people. Well, <laughs> now in, in the book, um, one, one of the things that you that you spend time on, which I really value and appreciate, is you you spend time noticing, or you, you spend time writing about how your dad was a noticer. And the reason that I love that you spoke about this and the attention that you gave this is because when I think about all the things that I love doing, those are not things that my parents told me to do. They mm. told me to go to piano lessons, yeah. but I caught salamanders with them. I caught frogs with them. I threw Frisbee with them. And those are the things that I love doing. And so, you know, I, I love just how you put that in, this, in the book that what, what you do, you actually role model it. And I, I think, you know, one day when I'm a parent in future and for, for any people who are watching this, I just think it's so important to realize that what you just tell your kids to do or tell your friends to do is not what they're going to do. <laughs> it's like, you know, I see so often you see smokers and they're trying to tell their kid, don't smoke like me, you know, like what the hell do they, you know, but that's what we do. And, and so, yeah, be aware. The, the other part of that, though, that is so difficult is, you know, kids, they can be on your neck day, you know, hour after hour. And there are times when you go, look, leave me alone. I'm busy. Can't you see what I'm doing? And that will scar the kid for life, you know, like these things we do too. And my daughter still tells me about a time I was so mad at her and she came and I said, and I just had a blow up and that really, really scarred her, you know. So, uh, but no, you, you don't teach kids values by telling them you you live it and that's how, how that's how they be they acquire them by what you do right now do, that's do why you... i was really struck when severn my when my daughter had made this splash in uh, at rio when she was 12 mm -hmm. and i remember watching her being interviewed and this guy came up and he was just so thrilled and said what a great speech you know you kids you're my you're the hope you kids are really you're gonna change the world and she said oh is that your excuse for doing nothing that wow. we're gonna depend on us she said why are we gonna be any diff different when we watch what you're doing if you're not changing how can you expect us to be any different you're our role models wow 12 years old this is that speech that was translated in Japanese and made her a bit of a, a celebrity in Japan, it, yeah? It's amazing. It's quite amazing, yeah. That is, yeah, that is fantastic. So I, I have two final questions for you, if I may. Um, the, the first is, in, in terms of the David Suzuki Foundation, what, what is the, the biggest initiative at the moment? And, and what excites you and just shakes you out of bed the most about what you're working on with the foundation and what the foundation is doing? Well, I have no illusions that the foundation is going to be the key to making, you know, we're part of what I hope is a massive movement. Within that movement, what we've been working on is the most difficult thing of all, and that is trying to change uh, people's way of seeing our relationship with the, the natural world. And that's changing your, your worldview from an anthropocentric to an ecocentric. And that's what we have to do in a, in a more crucial way. I think what's happened though, is the COVID crisis comes, uh, shortly after that comes the Black Lives Matter. Well, no, that, it was before COVID, but we get the George Floyd murder. And we've got this catastrophic market thing happening with the price of, uh, oil fluctuating these things have kind of all come together and we've got and we've got climate still there 
we've uh, we've got a moment to say we've got we can't go call this the new normal so that we can go back to the way it was before the covid hit mm. before covid hit was not normal it was absolutely destructive the way we were living we've got to go to something different so what i see is that we have a very limited window now to re make real change and that so i i see the the foundation being part of a movement saying look this is a better way of living it will give us give greater happiness it will uh, uh be more meaningful for us for our children and it will make a better uh planet a better world out there so this is what i think we have to do there's going to be an election coming up i'm hoping that we're going to be able to start calling out the need to aim at something different and you know one thing i like to point out when the americans accepted the challenge of sputnik and when kennedy said we're going to the moon they had no idea how they were going to do it all he said is we've got to get to the moon first and out of that not only are the americans the only country to get humans to the moon and back but every year when nobel prizes in science are announced guess who still gets more than half of them they're scientists they're american scientists or scientists working in america because 60 years ago the americans said we got to beat the russians nasa publishes a journal or magazine called um spin-off and it's filled with hundreds of things that have spun off you know 24-hour news channels gps laptop computers ear thermometers uh, space blankets i mean just all hundreds of things that have happened that nobody anticipated but that resulted because america said we got to get to the moon and that's the opportunity we have if we seize the moment now to say COVID has given us a chance to sit down and say we are on an absolutely crazy cat path that there's a better world that we can go to if we work towards it now we can go and really get get going on that so we have a, a real opportunity at this moment we we do but the, i guess the difference with the moon is that it is such a it's like it's a moonshot. It is one very clearly defined objective. It's a big, hairy, audacious goal, but it's clear. This is what we got to do. Mars must go into Mars. That's what we got to do. What What are the five or ten, like specific moonshot, tangible pieces that that me and everyone listening to this can start doing tomorrow to improve where we're at in a year from now? Well, there's no magic bullet. You know, of course, there are many things. Uh, that we can do, hundreds of things that we can do. I think the greatest uh, impact we're having, of course, is through consumption. And and that, I believe, was a deliberate thing that, you know, when I grew up, my parents had come through the Depression. So that had had marked them and shaped their, their values. So making money was something that was somehow, it was a necessity, but to buy the things you need, not to buy just for the sake of buying and you know my mother always said don't talk about money you know we were very poor but don't talk about money all the time it was we didn't look up to money <gasps> money we got to make more money that was something uh that we weren't bred to do um but we um i've forgotten what i was going to say there but it was something important <laughs> Well, we were talking about just this idea that there there weren't these clearly like oh, clearly it's about that consumption consumption. Mm -hmm. You know what pulled us out of the Great Depression was World War II, and as the war was coming to an end, Roosevelt set up the uh, economic advisors to the president and said, "How do we transition from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy?" And the answer was consumption. We've got to make consumption. Uh, Americans worship at the altar of consumption, buy things, use them up, throw them away and buy more. And when you, you use, introduce disposability into your consumers, uh, you've got the perfect system. You never run out of audience or market because you're using things, throwing it away and you have to buy more. And so 70% of our 
our economy now is based on consumption. And, you know, you go to, uh, you go to these Walmart, and if you think, what do I need here? What do I really need for my life? <laughs> Man, there isn't a hell of a lot you really need that you'd call a necessity. That's what's happened. You know, we came out of the war. We were very, very poor. And I wore blue jeans all my life because blue jeans wear like iron. Denim wears like iron. What kind of a society is it when we pay hundreds of dollars for brand new blue jeans already cut to shit? Like, what the hell is that saying about us as a society? It's sickening. It's absolutely sickening. And when you look at the garment industry and fashions and all of that, you've got to pay a, a huge uh, ecological cost for what they're doing. It's really disgusting, the, the whole fashion industry. But it's so we've got to look for consumption. But right now, I believe the most important thing is voting. We've got to start get people that were getting a, a vote, and we're only going to get people doing uh, really important things and hard things if the public mandate is there. When Al Gore was elected vice president, I called him the next day and I said, look, what can people like me do to help people like you? He said, don't look to people like me. He said, if you want change, you've got to convince the public there's a need for change. And you've got to show them what the options are and get the public to demand it. Then he said, every politician will fall all over themselves to jump on the bandwagon. And watching him and Clinton during their time, you realize how true that is. They were so restricted but because the American people weren't on side on the environment. So I, I think the immediate challenge is everybody that cares about the environment has got to vote. And everybody has got to say, I'm not going to vote for you or your party if you haven't put climate change and species extinction at the absolute top of your priorities in your agenda. My vote is going to go. I, for me, that's a short-term, immediate thing. We've got to make the uh, environmental movement a very powerful voting bloc. Mm -hmm. It's not about voting for the Green Party. It's about making this issue an important issue for uh, politicians. Makes sense. By the way, what, what was it that Jim Murray, uh, what was the advice that he shared with you that got you to care about the cranes? Care about the... The, the cranes. How, how did he change your perception? Oh, around? oh, well, that was over time that I, he introduced me to a man named John Livingston, who was a deep ecologist uh, who uh, used to work with the nature of things. And I began just over time and lots of discussions to recognize what a conceit it is to make everything about me. I mean, I think it is true. The loss of a species is a reflection or a diminishment of, of my, uh, of my uh, dignity and, and who I am as a species, but that should not be the driving force about uh, why we are um, try, trying to protect or save a lot of species. It's just that they have every right to exist. And in the natural world where everything is connected, they all have a role to play as well. We are the intrusive species. We are the alien intrusive species that has to be brought under control. And our consumptive demand and our numbers uh, are the, the two biggest challenges that nature faces right now. As they say, nature always bats last. Nature, the world existed long before there were humans on this planet. And we and it will exist and keep going on after we're gone. Absolutely. Well, this has been such a pleasure and I want to get you fishing. So thank you for taking the time. Thank good talking to you. Really appreciate it. And just for everything you do and how you inspire myself and, and those around me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Impact in the 21st Century, a podcast by Simbi Foundation. This episode was sponsored by RBC. And if you enjoyed listening, please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss new episodes. Stay tuned for the next episode, where I'll be speaking with social activist Nadlika Mandela about the legacy of the Mandela name, finding her own voice, 
and the importance of access to education for girls. Thank you.